we're a company that does training all over the world, uh, Europe, Australia, Canada, United States, Brazil, Puerto Rico. Uh, specifically, anything that has to do with urban forestry, arboriculture, logging, anything that has to do with chainsaws, people that climb trees, aerial lifts, all phases of arboriculture. Arboriculture ain't, has it <coughs> handles anything that has to do with woody vines, woody shrubs, and trees. So that could be using cranes, tree spades, the whole nine yards. So that, that's what we do. Um, I'm a member of the ANZ Z133 committee. That's the safety standards for the arboriculture industry. I'm a voting member. Been on that committee for oh, more than probably two decades now. I'm a founding member of the International Society of Arboriculture Safety Committee. I'm an inventor of equipment that some of these crews are out here using. As you can see, I make so much money on my royalties that I'm able to sit on my yacht in the, in the Caribbean. Um, <laughs> But uh, our main focus and our passion is tree worker safety. Uh, worker safety, that's, uh, that's really what we're into. I've had, personally I know four people that have been in my life that have been killed doing this work. It's very, very dangerous. Um, as you guys are probably well aware, there is no OSHA standard for doing tree care. There's 1910-266, which covers logging, yeah. right? And you guys, that's one of the if you look in the EM385, that's one of the standards you guys are supposed to be looking at. But however, we're in an urban environment a lot, like Tuscaloosa. You know, yeah, maybe we're cutting one tree down like a logger might, but we've got utilities, we've got roadways, we've got underground utilities, we've got pedestrians, public, yeah. <laughs> public and to cut a tree down according to 1910-266 doesn't fit the box. There's not enough room. You've got to, you know, there's, like in 1910-266, it's, Two tree links away. When you two tree links away, maybe two houses over, right? So you, you got to use a little bit of common sense when looking at. If you look at the ANSI standard, you know you can be as close as need be if you're directly involved with the felling operation. So which standard do you guys, you know, have to leave that use? So that's a good place to start. Would be where's the middle ground or what makes this common sense. Um, I'm a champion climber, a two-time over 40. I'm way over 40 now, um, but uh, that and I'm a champion logger, Arbor Games champion uh, years ago. So I know a little bit about cutting, felling, climbing. Uh, I still climb a little bit, I still cut, um, that sort of thing. We are contracted by P&J. We wear their red hard hats and their safety division vests and we work as their agents. We're P&J employees or federal government employees really. But we work for PNJ and we go around and do site visits and check on crews and we stop bad behavior. We do our best to correct it. Uh, in worst case scenarios, we put a stop to it immediately and come up with another plan. In rare cases, we'll actually come in where the crews, the Army Corps uh, QAs, the QCs of PNJ, they don't know how to deal with a tree. We'll come in uh, and myself or one of my guys will actually help assist or actually physically get that hazardous situation remediated right there on the spot. So, um, are there any questions about my background? Did I earn the right to be standing in front of you talking today? Oh, yeah. If I haven't earned the right, then I've wasted yours and Jerry's time. Um, I don't know everything. I don't claim to be an expert. Um, one thing that's, I, I'm sad about in our industry, we don't have, other than the Z133, we don't have clear industry safety standards. We've got best practice and some guidelines, but they're, there's not, not one set yeah. way to do things. Um, Ninety plus percent of the crews I see, they wouldn't make it on a crew for me. So that, that we're getting people, we don't know where they're coming from. Uh, I ran into a crew yesterday, they rented all their buckets, they went to Walmart and Home Depot and bought saws and ropes. And does that qualify them? Probably not, you know. So <laughs> when we don't know that, when we interview them and they go through the process, not till we get out in the field that we might see that hey we've got some issues there so Scott if you would you know when I sat in on your training the other day if you can kind of capsulize I'm a contractor I'm coming in right knocking on the door I'm sitting through your briefing yep. what are you covering in that briefing to kind of get a feel because while I was yep. watching you you're kind of reading those crews as they're answering exactly. the questions and you're getting exactly. either warm fuzzy or like okay exactly. this isn't going to happen so can you walk us yep. through and that's where our instructor training comes in we we can read the class um, some class we can already tell after a few probing questions that yeah, they're more advanced so yeah. we'll cut it we'll skip over some of the minor stuff that we know that they are they already know but then I had a class the other day that I mean these guys you know I don't know where they came from and it was pretty obvious that 
when we signed them off, they were signed off to do ROE, hold flags, and, and drag brush kind of stuff. So, um, but what happens, there can be upwards of three orientation meetings that these crews go through. When they first check in with their buckets, there's a general safety orientation. It can take an hour, hour and a half. Then they'll come over to uh, the main facility where they go through a more specific tree worker safety orientation. That takes about half an hour to 45 minutes. Then they turn it over to me where I go specific to tree workers, chainsaws, aerial lifts, climbers. So if I know I've got climbers in the room, then I do climber, aerial lifts, and chainsaw. If I've only got aerial lift operators and chainsaw, then that's what I'll do. If I only have chainsaw, so we were able to modify that orientation. But they get a couple of hours of orientation before they ever even uh, go out in the field. Did that answer your question? Well, there was more than that because after the orientation, I remember the other day, you actually said, okay, yep. I'm going to finish this. I'm going to go out and look yep. at you here. Thank you. Thank you. Again, I'm no expert at this, so cut me some cycle. Thank you for bailing me out. Yeah, if they're a climber, well, I literally inspect their gear. I make them tie just the most basic of knots that demonstrates yeah, that competency. Yeah. Um, and when they do their bucket testing, and which I haven't been out on the bucket testing in Tuscaloosa, um, we make them literally get in it, fly it, that they can operate it. Everyone on their crew has to be able to operate it on the ground controls in case of emergency and bring it down. Your yeah. co-instructor did that. I can't remember his name, but he, uh, he might have been Mike or Charles, probably. Yeah, maybe. Black hair or blonde hair. One He's of kind of short guy. I can't. Yeah, probably Charles. Yeah. Where were you, Rainsville or Coleman? Oh, it was right up here in Huntsville. Uh, it was Mad probably Madison. Charles then. Madison, I think yeah. it is. Yeah, yeah Charles, Charles yeah. Rayfield. But he he's did, a he past that, champion climber himself. Yeah, so. he did that very thing. I was yeah. very impressed. Yeah, yeah. Hey Scott, do they do, do, the, do the climbers? Is there a way like for us, like when we show up and a guy's in a bucket, uh, you know, we don't know if he's a if he's a climber or not. Is there? Did yes. they have some kind of card or yes, something that absolutely. says, "Hey, I did the training and I can do this," or yeah. you know, because we don't know. We don't when they worry. sit through my class at the end of the class. I won't sign off on any of it until I've got the documentation. So if they're a bucket guy, they'll have a badge, right? If they're a climber or a bucket operator or a combination of that, they're going to have an actual ID card with a photo. And on there, you're going to see BT or BTO, which stands for bucket truck operator, okay? You'll see CL or CLM for climber. You'll see QLC, which is qualified to do line clearance. That means they can come within proximity, which is within 10 feet of an energized conductor. They've already got the training to be able to establish minimum approach distance. Um, you'll see saw for sawman on there. And you'll see RES, rest, meaning they've got rescue training, so they can do rescue. So if you show up on a site and someone's climbing, you're going to want to see who's the second climber. Where is that person? Because they're not supposed to be climbing on this contract without a second person trained as a climber and rescue on site with gear handy. Doesn't have to have the gear on, but the gear's got to be ready. So one climber's in the tree, second climber's on the ground just in case. Oh, that's good to know. Okay. That's like God. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a good buddy system. From a production standpoint, it's not real efficient, but it's very, very, very safe. Now that yeah. second climber, he, can he still be working or does he have to be designated? Generally working, but okay. he's got to be within normal voice communication and, and aware of the operation that's going on. Okay. In, in traditional tree work uh, uh, production, both climbers would probably be climbing different trees. You know, if this guy got hurt, this guy would come down and go up and get him. Uh, and with the bucket, uh, you, you'll have guys on the ground won't have, typically have the badge if they're just flagmen or, or ground workers. But they also have to have been checked off as being able to operate the bucket truck from the ground, okay? So they can bring an injured person in the bucket down. The climbers, I mean, you're, you had mentioned that sometimes the climbers get out of the bucket. Is that right? Correct. Climber is someone who doesn't use a bucket. They can oh, take the bucket up and get out and climb the tree, or they can physically climb the tree from the ground up. So a guy's in a bucket. We're going to show you some of that outside. A guy's in a bucket. He shouldn't be getting out of, out of the bucket. He can get out of the bucket. He can get out of the bucket. Okay, okay. However, he has to already have set a climbing line in, which I'm going to show you what that looks like outside. Okay. okay. And he's got to already be tied to the tree before he gets out of the bucket. Okay. Okay. Yes, sir. He doesn't use gloves when he's in the tree? They recommend using gloves when, when you're in the tree, but I can tell you that here's a gray area I want you guys to be aware of. Sometimes it's very difficult to manipulate your climbing system okay. and hold the rope yeah, sometimes with some types of gloves. That, you know, not required to wear gloves. While I'm in the P &J wants them wearing gloves all the time. Okay. But I'm, I'm just letting you know mm -hmm. for some climbers, 
it can be a little more difficult moving okay. around the tree with gloves on. But if they're in the bucket, they're on the ground, they're handling material, there yeah. should be no excuse for them. Um, yeah, we had one too that didn't want to wear the vest, which I agreed. I said, no problem. Up in the tree? He, he had a uh, reflective fluorescent shirt on, but right. he didn't want to wear the vest because it would get hung up. Yeah. yeah. See, that's making a good call in my opinion. Yeah. Some trees make sense to not have the vest on. Yeah, but, some but, but some he, trees, it's not a big deal. It's a very open canopy. Mm -hmm. You might not, you know, yeah. wear the vest. But he still had a like, fluorescent shirt on. Like, I like that. Yeah, so but that's good. It, you know, it made good sense. You could get, you know, caught in it. So. so walk me through. A contractor comes onto a site where we have a, let's just say, a little stand of trees. Right. You explained to students the other day or the class that was in that you held that there's a process. I mean, you're going to come in and you have to do certain maps or drawings. Right. Can you? Well, they're <clears throat> they'll when they get out on the site, there there's going to be one of your people. Um, an Army Corps typically there. They can't, if it's an ROE site, there will be definitely be an Army Corps person there that made sure we got permission. We don't go on to any property without an Army Corps there. There's also a Phillips and Jordan QC person. They're, they're working in, they're like a team. It's kind of neat to see the Army Corps and the, and the Phillips and Jordan yeah. QC. There's a lot of ROEs where I'm at. That's exactly right. And you guys stay together and you talk it out and you're happy with the work. They make the ticket, the crew's happy. The crew doesn't go on without one of you guys there, um, and there'll be a site map, and they're supposed to delineate the property line with ribbons so that they don't go outside. There'll be issues where half the tree's on a yard and half the tree's not. They're going to talk to one of your people. How do we handle this? Do we leave it? You guys might have to check and see if we've got an ROE for next door or not. We may have to cut it at the property line and leave half on the other side. Um, did that answer most of it? Or yeah, because you had them do an analysis, almost like it's like oh, a yeah, job yeah. hazard analysis. Almost. Yeah, there's there's a couple things. Just even beyond this storm, we're supposed to be doing a job site uh, briefing every morning anyway. So in the job site briefing that they should be doing is uh, is number one identifying all the hazards on the site. So the crew stays together and they find them. They de they determine can we can we reduce the risk to an acceptable level? Can we deal with the hazards there? If we can, we move forward. So everyone knows what the hazards are. We've coned them, we've flagged them, whatever it takes. We've got a piece of equipment in to get the tree down, whatever the case is, how we're gonna deal with it. Once they've done that, uh, they also need to know what my job is, your job, everyone's job on the job site is. Once they're clear with that, everyone can go to work. Um, right before that, what we've asked them to do is have an emergency response plan. And this is something I'm finding everywhere I go. It's they have a plan, but they don't know where they are. Yeah. <laughs> so if you don't know where you are, what's the point in having the plan? Because you're just going to be scrambled. But the emergency response plan is is number one, obviously knowing where you are, um, and you need a single point of contact. So someone on the job site is going to be the one designated to call 911. They need to know the address. They need to know where the paperwork is. So they call 911. You also determine who's first aid CPR. That person is going to be the one administering first aid. Okay, so everyone has a job in this emergency response plan. If the single point of contact who was supposed to make the call happens to be the one who gets hurt, we do also have a second point of contact. So, so we have two points of contact and, and first aid CPR field. Yes, sir. That is very much like the rescue plan. Pretty much. Okay. Yep. It's okay. an emergency response plan for every site. Um, but for Phillips and Jordan, we do that. We, we might be on a logging job at a coal mine in West Virginia where our emergency response plan is we have to have stretchers because there's no way EMTs are going to get there. We've got to physically hike them up to a logging road and we've got a helicopter site already picked out. We know where the nearest hospital is. The whole crew discusses that. The paperwork is, is kept in that one ATV and everyone knows that it's right there. We've got satellite phones. That kind of thing is all part of our talked about every morning. Yes, you guys walk through that, the plan? No, we. Do, I talk about the plan with okay. the crews as they come okay. in, saying this is okay. what we would like to see. Okay, good. Which, good. I'll be honest with you, it's out of 99% of them, this is the first time they've ever heard of doing such a thing. Yeah. <laughs> and I get on them about, uh, you need to know where you are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I get on them about, if you've got a supervisor, they need to be supervising. I, I was on a job site, and I don't know who's got the northwest area way up there, but I was with the with, uh, crew, and well, who's in charge here? Well, he's at the store trying to find chainsaws. Yeah, we get that a lot, too. We'll ask him if there's a problem. Who's for them here? And everybody just kind of Yeah, it's just one of these going on. <laughs> yeah. right? mm -hmm. Everyone starts pointing, right? So. Yes, sir. This uh, job site briefing? Yeah. 
Is that documented every day? Should be. Should be written out. They have forms to do that on. I know with P&J where we're at, it's very well yeah. documented. Yeah. Yeah, there's a form for that. Uh, bucket crews, there's a form that bucket crews should be filling out every day. They also, provide, uh, they also provide the contractor employee a card. Yep. A P and J training card. That way they have it on their pocket. Yep. That way if they go to another. That was area. the second part. The ones that climb, uh, use bucket trucks, train and rescue, and have saw all get a badge. Okay. Everyone else, like if they're just saw only, using chainsaws only, or flagging, or on the ground, or equipment, or driver, they'll just get a little pocket card. Okay, with it signed and checked off what they're qualified to do. So if you see someone in a bucket and they can't demonstrate. You know, show you that they've got the BTO or BTO. Yeah, it'll be specific what training they have. And that way, if, if they happen to show up in your county, you can say, okay, you've had these three uh, courses. Right. Yeah. But if, you're, if you have an activity they haven't done yet, and that's not on that card, then they, they yeah, you train. Yeah, you're not qualified to do yeah, that. It's, good, it's a good system. Yeah. It's the best you can do with this many people yeah. out there. You know? yeah. And really, to, to do a full competency testing, you know, like if I was to test one of you on chainsaw, we're talking minimum an hour to an hour and a half of you physically having to cut something down. That, that's the way my company would qualify you with your competency. Here, we ask a lot of questions, and the next best thing we can do is go out and watch you. And if you're not cutting very good, I talk to your supervisor. Uh, and if that's not getting it, then we have to go a different route. Yes, sir. I maybe think of three things. Once, when you're, uh, those three things you're talking about uh, with the contractor the other day is the number one, how to cut. Yes. And this is what I better see. And this is what I better not see because yep. of pinch points and things like that. Yep. The other thing that I thought was very interesting <coughs> is he asked this contractor, do you have any wedges? And, he, and they're like, they're in the like look for them. <laughs> well, they're kind of looking at each other, do I have wedges? I don't know. But I think you, when I was watching you, it told me that, okay, these guys don't, maybe not quite up to speed yeah, on where they're going. And number three was uh, the tree that was laying on a tree. So he actually had this bow in this right. tree that you got a snag, so you got a snag hanging on it. And he was, just, and I appreciate what Scott was doing. He said, "So how do you cut that? How do you cut that so you don't make somebody uh, a widow tonight?" You know, basically. Exactly. That's what I got out of it. And it was interesting because these folks were like, "Well, nobody wants to say anything because it may be wrong." <laughs> <laughs> but if you would walk us through those yeah. those three areas, the uh, I can pull it. I want to see the stay on camera. Yeah. You can take that off. That was yesterday's meeting. It was thank you. The. Uh, what I'd like to do, is, is this going in the direction you want it to go in? Yep. You're comfortable with this? Yep. You guys are new back there. Hi, my name's Scott. Uh, I've been in the business 33 years, and I still don't know what I'm doing yet, but I'm working on it. <laughs> Every day is a learning experience for me. I don't know where our color curtains are. Uh, any, there's a marker right there. So um, I explained to them, and <clears throat> a lot of what I, I explained to them fits right into 1910. Are you guys familiar with 1910 266? That's a logging standard. If you look in there, or if you go to OSHA eTools under logging, these cutting techniques are what, what's expected from OSHA is right in there. Uh, in the annex of ANSI Z133, there's what, what's expected in there as well. I go over a couple of things with them. Um, the one that Jerry was talking about, um, you know, I'll, I'll draw like a tree that's under pressure. Maybe another tree fell on it and it's bent over. That's called a spring pole. Um, I explained, I asked them, do they know where compression wood is and tension wood is? That may be uh, foreign to you guys, but obviously this piece of wood being bent over, obviously the fibers in the wood on the outside are being under tension, being pulled apart. So what do you think is going on with the fibers on the inside of the turn? Exactly. So you've got fibers that are being compressed. And somewhere in the middle, compression and tension are going to meet. And a typical, uh, someone who's not experienced in dealing with in, uh, spring poles or wood under pressure might be to just to start cutting. What do you think happens when all that tension is released? The piece could explode, throwing the saw could hit them. Uh, this is a big killer in the logging because we'll fell trees and lots of its branches will be under tension and if you don't know which is tension or compression. Um, so I'll go over this with them. Uh, obviously, uh, a rule of thumb, and I can tell you that 99% of guys cutting don't know this, but you want to deal with compression first, okay? Um, so there's several techniques. One is you make a series of relief cuts. Anybody do woodworking in here? You know what I'm talking about. If you want to take a piece of wood and make it bend without breaking, mm -hmm. right, curve cuts. So you make a series of shallow, and again, you've got to be fairly good with your saw and understand wood, or if you go too deep, it'll pension 
and now you've got a stuck saw and a dangerous piece of wood. That's one technique. Another technique is, a, is called the router technique, um, where you basically take your chainsaw, instead of cutting, if you guys can imagine the chain is my hand there, instead of going with the relief cuts or curve cuts, we'll literally use the chain and router and basically remove material slowly and gently in the apex of that turn so the piece just gently you're releasing all that stored energy. So you get to what nothing left but the tension in it basically of this and you've you've taken a violent stored energy situation and turn it into a much less violent situation. So I'll review stuff like that with them. I'll go over um, I'll go over some cuts with them, see if I can still draw them. Imagine making a cut and a cut and this piece of wood comes out at your, your notch. Uh, review no bypass. Because the purpose of a notch, and we'll, we'll talk maybe some more outside, but the purpose of, does anyone know what a notch is for when you fell a tree? How many have been in the backyard and cut a tree down with a chainsaw? Everyone in here? What's the purpose of the notch? You may know, you may not. It, it, I just saw it, so I guess that's what I'm supposed to do. You're creating a hole for the tree to fall into, right? So that's what the notch is. And then the second thing you need, what, what else do you need for the tree to fall into that? Well, you, you got to do a back cut. But there's something between the back cut and the notch that has all the control, that makes it all happen. It's the hinge. So this section, you want to leave a section there. The problem with, and I've seen it on every job site, they'll cut a notch out, but they really have bypass. Where is the notch really, even though they have this really pretty looking thing? Where's the notch really? It's the back of one of these. So now they have a little quarter inch notch. All they've done is wasted their time making this big chunk of wood fall out because when they do their back cut, it's going to close, right? As the tree settles down, it's going to close one of these. And I'll, I'll draw another picture. <clears throat> So typically what you'll see the most of is probably a 45 degree notch, like so. Uh, what we would prefer to see, but they don't have to, 45 is acceptable. What we'd prefer to see is a more open face notch, which is somewhere between 70 and 90 degrees, where this is 45. And anybody have an idea why that might be besides Jerry? So this is a 100 foot tall tree. All y'all go back to uh, high school now. You got a 100 foot tall tree. As this tree falls over, this notch is going to close, is it not? Would you all agree with me? At what degree of angle will that notch be completely closed? So if it's a 100 foot tall tree, tell me where 45 is. All right, so if the notch closes, it's a 100 foot tall tree, how high is it still in the air? It's 50 feet in the air, and you're, now your notch is closed. So only two things can happen if your notch closes. Anyone know what those are? Take a guess. One is it's going to stop, right, in midair, which is now you've got to go back into a violently dangerous situation, which is pretty rare for a 100-footer to stop. Or it breaks off the hinge. And at that point, you now have a 100-foot log, free-falling at 50 feet. Gravity never takes a day off. And it's going to fall wherever gravity wants it to go. With the 70 to 90 degree notch, it starts to fell the tree. Tell me when to stop when the notch closes. Right there. So, yeah, so if it's 90, guess what? Tree's on the ground. And that hinge worked all the way. So how should the back cut be made? Um, we prefer bore cuts, but that's not going to happen out here, guys. They're going to typically make a straight back cut. So on 45, slightly stepped up. You see this section of wood we leave? Literally works like a hinge, okay? Uh, with a 70 to 90, even width, and leave a hinge, okay? This is, I, this is what we teach, this is what we prefer, okay? Uh, when you get in a situation where you have an extreme leaner, and you start to cut a notch here and start a back cut, what do you think could happen? You guys remember the first page? Mm -hmm. 
Is a tree with extreme lean any different than a tree under pressure? A tree with extreme lean, what are the fibers on the outside? Fibers on the inside? And you start to cut, and what did I say cut first? But then they go to do their back cut, what's going to happen? The tree could delaminate, split, barber chair, just like this could. So there's a technique for boring into the tree, you remove all that material first. So. Is this making sense? Not bored you to tears yet? I have a question. Yes, sir. On the, say, a 90 degree open face cut, the bottom cut, do they use the top part of the blade to cut that? You can use any part of the blade, and that's a great question. This is the chainsaw. Can you all humor me? <laughs> um, does it roughly resemble a, a Scott Prophet chainsaw? Right? <clears throat> so <clears throat> you, have, you have different reaction forces, right? If you cut with the bottom of the bar, it's going to pull you into the tree. If you cut with the top portion of the bar, it will push you away, but it's totally good. You can use any part of the bar. But here's where you get into this gray area right here. If you divide the nose in half, You got no and go. You guys have all heard the term kickback, right? Yeah. Basically, what kickback is, is each tooth, um, again, I'm not an artist, so don't. Does that resemble a tooth to you guys? Mm -hmm. uh, this part of the tooth out here is known as the depth gauge, okay? There's a relationship between this depth gauge and the leading edge of this tooth, somewhere between 20 and 30 thousandths. It, that's how much wood it allows it to bite. So the, each cutter on their chain, there might be 84 of them on there, allow a certain amount of wood fiber to be cut, right? Problem is, is as this chain is turning in this direction, what happens to this depth gauge as it turns the corner? It's minimized. It drops out of the way. Now you're allowing this tooth to bite more wood than it can physically cut. So if the chain stops, what happens to energy? You guys all remember from school, right? Is energy lost? What's, where, where, what happens to energy? Yeah, it's, it's just shifted somewhere else. It's converted to something else. And in this case, when we stop the chain, the engine literally tries to turn inside the chain. And when it does that, it literally forces a kickback and it throws the chain back. So that's no, this is go. You can use the bottom corner because remember, the depth gauge has now turned the corner and is now back into play. And you can use the bottom corner to literally bore it. And that's a great way to deal with trees that are down, under tension, heavy leaners. So, so if they're cutting with the top, good. Cutting with the bottom, good. Cutting here, good. But if they're letting that part of the bar come in contact with something, that's where they're going to run into. That's why we're making them wear hard hats, face shields, eyeglasses, cut resistant gloves, chaps, and all that good stuff. So, Good questions. Wedges. Wedges. That's where we started this whole thing. Right? Um, yeah, most of them don't have wedges. Um, uh, wedges are a valuable tool. You can drive a wedge in. Uh, standard wedge is about one inch thickness at the back end. Um, if, if you'll just humor me, because I know some of you mathematicians in here are going to find all the flaws in what I'm getting ready to say, but if, if the tree was a perfect square cube of 12 by 12 by 12 by 100 feet tall, and we drove a one inch wedge all the way in and made the first 12 by 12 cube lean forward, how far would the very top cube have leaned forward? 100 foot tall tree. 100 foot tall tree. It's perfectly square. One inch wedge driven in here. Can we give you the quick answer? 14. 100 inches. So how much is that in feet? About eight. Yeah. So almost a little, almost, yeah, 90, 100 inches, 96 is eight, eight, right? So it's a little over eight feet. With one little wedge, that much forward lean. But there's other very valuable uh, ways to use wedges. What if you have, I'm just going to use the foliar paper, but you've got a log, you know, elevated, right? Where's tension? Bottom. Compression? Bottom. Okay. So in this case, what did I say you deal with first? Compression. So you can start to cut in, you can drive a wedge in and finish your cut out. What do you think that wedge does is where it keeps it from tensioning the bar. And when you get to the bottom, the log falls away because it's got a half inch pushing it over. Um, same token, if you have a log that's completely on the ground and you drive a wedge, what do you think happens? 
It literally will lift. Think about it, you're driving the wedge in and spreading it apart. It'll literally lift a log up off the ground. So it's a great way to deal with wood that's on the ground. Are you going to find them out there with the crews? <clears throat> No, you find me and Norm when we're, when we're running a chainsaw, or Charles or Mike, yeah, we're, we wear them because they're great for, for that. Basically, what I'm trying to cram is about uh, 16 to 24 hours worth of chainsaw <laughs> training that we typically do for a living into, oh, 30 minutes yeah. now. <clears throat> so, other questions specific to chainsaw? Yeah, I got, uh, we, got, we got some wet debris stuff going on. And we got leaners and hangers, so they're, they're, they're trees that have come off the bank. Yeah. They're broke. We got a yeah. barge out there. Yeah. The guys on the barge got a chainsaw guy who's on a barge. Yeah. He's trying to cut these things. And uh, it's it's kind of like you're talking about the tension, you know, yeah. issue. Yeah. Any other any ideas on how we can do that safely? I think it's they're working off a barge doing yeah. the cutting. They had a little crane on the barge, maybe. Yeah, you know, little, choke and lift stuff. Got a traco. You know. So he yeah, grabbed one with side. With a thumb claw on it, that right. might be nice yeah. too. Yeah. 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 And now you're running into taking something, when you start getting a man or a woman in a machine grabbing a piece of wood and a man and a woman running a chainsaw, you want to talk about a communication need issue? Yeah, you know, sure, yeah. this person right. cutting and this person moving, you know. That's right. Uh, I'm, I'm more inclined to let the machine just gnaw and rip it out and get away, but there will be cases out there, so I'm saying there's no black or white on some of the techniques. There are some black and white on PPE yeah, and things. Yeah. Yeah. So you got to use some, the safe, sometimes the safest way to deal with a tree is with a crane or maybe a helicopter or, you know, explosives. I don't know. I mean, there's, we've run into some really crazy. So that's a whole other department. We need, now we need, you know, we need the Marine Demolition Team in here. Jerry, you need an EOD safety guy. Yeah, we've got to have a, a bomb plan. Bruce Barrett was helicopter. Those are all good questions. Uh, for the rest of my time with you to be successful, because you guys are investing at least another hour with me, uh, what would the outcome need to be for this to be a successful time for you? I mean, for us in safety, on the safety side, just so we can go out, know the right questions to ask, you got to tell who's trained, you know, those kind okay. of things are from, a, from a, a safety visit standpoint. So know the right cues. Would, uh, would it be fair if I added in there, maybe know what right looks like? Well, I was yeah, going to say, we need to be able to yeah. recognize the basics of that. Right. You know, ID. Yeah, we may not be experts, but we can at least right. basic good behavior. Right. Yeah. Good practices, work practices. Or okay, good. Yeah. Do you have a checklist? Uh, there's a basic checklist on what we're looking for, PPE, flagman, cones, flags out, chaps. That's kind of what the, the majority of our technique, behavior tech, it's kind of in between. Uh, I'm, I'm talking about checklist for, uh, you know, the answers for their car, and see if they're certified, uh, rescue plan, and and stuff like that. Well, I have a list in the car I'll be happy to share with you. you. You might want to make a few notes of things you would like to ask. Well, that question is almost twofold. One is for the groundwork, so I know what the threat questions are. How do I identify basic good behavior? Yeah. Now I'm going to kick it up up into an aerial point of view. So for mm -hmm. me, there's two two areas that those questions apply for: on the ground and up in the bucket. Okay. So, and some of them will be the same whether you're on the ground or in the bucket. Make any so, difference. so hit me on the. Do, do I need to write that here? Or is no, it, I get it. You'll get it, and we. And remember, I have a very limited amount of time. So, but guess what? I will do as a favor to my new friend Jerry. I'll give you my cell number, Ooh, and you'll be more I'm more than happy to well, answer that's it one question I had and answer it. Yeah. How about I give it to you now, contracted under. instead of me trying to drag out, what's the question? I, I just want to make sure there's no problem contractually. Cause they work for us. Okay. Yeah, we, we work. Essentially. Yeah, we That's great. <laughs> uh, and the way I operate, my, my passion is helping people. Um, we're all about service. So, if you call and have a question, I'll do my best to answer it, you know, as best I can. There's no value. You're not calling me to find out, you know, what the pay scale is for, you know, or what's the secret code to get into the back door of the office. You know, you're calling me, hey, there's a guy in a bucket and he's doing this. Is that, is that right? You know, that I'm all about. So, 404-217-5500. Uh,
Right. All right, anyone else? For the next hour to be of value, you, a good use of Army Corps of Engineer time, what would the outcome need to be for you? Someone from the peanut gallery to the left. Just give me one thing and I'll leave you alone, I promise. Uh, environmental hazardous materials. Okay, and if I can't answer that, you'll let me off the hook, right? All right. So you, you've got some in by wrong has stuff. <laughs> You'll have to prod me with some questions that maybe pertain to the field. Yes, ma'am. Well, just for background, we're all here for NEPA compliance. So okay. we're going out doing site inspection checks, um, mainly for our NEPA compliance. But if there's anything you'd want us okay. to know, that would be helpful. Okay. I don't know what that is, but maybe we'll figure it out together. You, you're going to cover, cover fall protection? Yeah, that, we're going to do that outside. Do that. Um, I can do a little bit inside. Um, I know it's nice in here, but you know, I think you guys see in gear. Um, so fall protection would be something. So now you've got two things. So if I get both of yours, you're going to be extremely happy, right? Well, yeah, absolutely. Okay. One more, yes, sir. On that fall protection, is there a chef like one? Somewhere on there it says from 19, no. No. I know on some of the fall things, we're going to be. Some do, yeah. 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 If you're, if you're talking, I ain't going to We need to describe this and take it out of the With climbing gear, it's more, more or less a wear issue. Wear if, you, wear. if you work, like I have an instructor that's in Central Florida, uh, he'll, his hardware, his aluminum and steel, will corrode from body sweat and humidity within 12 months. Whereas the same gear with my instructor in Boston, Massachusetts, his will last five years. It's more visual wear and tear. It's an you're, they're supposed to be inspecting their gear as per the ANC standards daily. daily. Yeah. That's ropes, connecting links. Mm -hmm. And we do that. We were out on a job site, I want to say Pickens or someplace, and their their hardware, we, we told them they couldn't use it. They had to get new stuff. We confiscated one thing, it was so bad. Mm -hmm. So, so, so fall protection. They're going to call in the difference, fall restraint, fall tailing, you're going yes. to cover. Let's do that inside and then we'll go outside. Yes, sir. I, I have a question on that. Uh, Anchorage, I've looked in two manuals of bucket trucks and it does not tell me how many pounds that Anchorage plant will, will handle right. for an impact. Right. You know, so, you know, my experience as an instructor, I know for, for fall wrestling, 5,000, for a fall restraint, right. it's 3,000. But on itself, the so many smaller bucket trucks don't look like they would take the full impact of, of a fall resting. Uh, prod me to hit that <laughs> specifically when I'm going over this. Keep in mind, if, if 5,000 pounds of dynamic force on the body, who cares if the anchor point well, makes it or not, because they're going to be a bag full of... Well, no, it's supposed to be reduced down, I think, to... 18 or something like that. But, yeah. but, you know, I mean, the rule of thumb I always been given is, is if it looks like it can support hanging or suspending full-size pickup truck, right. then it's good enough for fall <laughs> resting. Right. But I look at some of those small little booms mm -hmm. on a, on a maybe a one-ton chassis yeah. truck, yeah. and if they're fully extended out, yeah. there's no way you're going yeah. to hang 5,000 pounds on that. They've, they've tested them for that, so they should do that. But, you know, what I don't think is factored in is, you know, I weigh, you know, I'm only 150 pounds. So you imagine a guy bigger than me that weighs 220 or something. I had a guy at the rep. Nobody got it. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I got it. I got it. But if I fell six feet out, full six feet out of a bucket, how much energy would I, how much dynamic load or force would I create? Well, that was a question, John. He had a, I had a big guy in a bucket. He was about 320, 340. Yeah. And uh, I'm looking at he him. He was barely legal to be in the bucket. He's got the harness on, and I'm looking at him going, holy shit. All right, well, let, let's get into it a little bit. Uh, and, uh, and that was something in your email. So if, if we've got a, a worker and they're tied in, clipped in, short things there, what would you call that? Fall, Fall restraint. Restraint? Fall restraint. He just has a, uh, it's a delt. A delt. A delt uh, yeah, uh, it could be full body, but the way he's attached, he's, he's anchored <laughs> into the sides. Plus the position more well. That would be restraining you from being able to yeah, fall. Yeah, would, right, would, yeah, would you yeah, agree yeah, with real. me there? That's right. Right. Yeah, yeah, I can't, I can't fall. fall. Right? And then what if we've got a person that's, <coughs> you know, attached here? Dorsal attachment here, what would you call that? 
So that's the, that's to catch him when he does fall. So that would be a rest. Yeah. All right. So what do you what do you call when? The worker is attached here. <laughs> fall arrest, fall restraint. Depends on that line. I mean, if it's, it's got a, if it's designed where it won't, won't give him any more room, and he yeah. can't get near the edge. And but they can move right. all about. Right, right, right. right. So what would you call that? Physically go over the edge. Yeah. So it's restraint. Restraint. Yeah. So it'd be fall restraint. Yeah. And allows them to work. What would you call it? Restraint. Restraint. Maybe some arrest involved. There would be some swinging here, right? And work positioning, possibly. And that's that's the the huge thing that you guys are going to have to get in your mind. Tree climbers. We're not doing fall restraint. We're not doing fall arrest. We are doing work positioning. Our harnesses aren't designed to be fallen into. Their, their harnesses are down low. You'll see some harnesses that might have built in, but unless they're attached here, if not here, okay? If it's attached here, it's fall arrest. If it's attached here, it's going to be work positioning, and that's what tree workers do. We do work positioning equipment. Well, that's we don't allow enough slack in our system that we can fall any distance, okay? That's where we get conflict because I believe our manual tells us that we cannot rely solely on right. positioning. We have to have fall resting in addition to that. See, we'll have an overhead line, and we're going to show you outside how it's rigged. We have an overhead line that allows us to move up and down and slot laterally within the work zone of a tree. Uh -huh. We also use a work positioning lanyard that once we get to where we're going, we use the lanyard as extra work positioning, and we also have, so we have a combination of something that's keeping us from falling out of the tree, plus something that keeps us from lateral movement in the tree once we start to do our work. A uh, key point is anytime the worker is using a chainsaw, they have to have two points of uh, protection in the tree. One has to be a climbing line, and the other has to be, it doesn't have to be, but at least one climbing line and a work positioning lanyard. Okay, so and while you're there, I'm sorry to interrupt. Talk to me about getting my, my chainsaw up. I mean, is that chainsaw yeah. going up with me when I go in the tree, or do you want to go uh, If, you, if you read the EM385, oh, okay. you go up and then you haul it up. You okay. pull it up. If you read AMC Z133, you can tie it on the end of your climbing line only and pull it up. Hook it to your belt. Go to work. When you're done with that section of the tree, you hook it back to your belt and you move. That That is the way arborists do it. So many will. Uh, climb, but the majority will climb without a chainsaw, have it tied on, they'll bring it up, they'll clip it in. Why carry that extra 8 to 15 pounds? Um, and then through the, the course of working the tree, meaning cutting, pruning, removing parts of the tree, they'll keep their chainsaw with them. When they return to the ground, their chainsaw hangs right there. And those very small chainsaws that we will argue about later um, are specifically designed for climbers to wear on it. That's why they're short and they move the handle to the top so that it's not a trip hazard when they're in the tree. So, um, In true high angle work, is anyone familiar with true high angle rope access work? Um, in true high angle rope, you know, like off a building, they, they have known rated fixed anchor points. They know what they are, how they're rated, right? They'll have one line that hangs down as a safety line, right? They'll be hanging on another line working off another line, and excuse my stick figures, and they'll have a little backup. So if something were to go wrong on the line they're working from, they fall, they get caught on this line. Okay. And they can move up or down. But in rope access work, a high angle rescue work, this is what their protocols are. In tree work, we do not do that. We use one rope only. The rope goes up, over an anchor point, usually a limb, and back down and attach to the climber. And we'll show you this outside and they'll have a little short piece of rope. So they're, they're able to move up by moving this knot up and they're, they're able to move down by lessen, pulling on the knot and lowering themselves down. So it's, it's work positioning, okay? There's no way we could do tree work if we had to find two rated anchor points in a tree like this. It's just not gonna happen. 
you guys have seen it. There's trees out there that got eight branches, and the top 50 feet is gone. So where do you anchor in there? So there's there's all kinds of different ways of, of establishing uh, natural, not natural, but uh, we call them false crotching or, or uh, anchor points, man-made anchor points in the trees. So. Does that help you guys with the fall arrest, fall protection, fall restraint? And so, yeah, this is going to be corn. And no, we don't climb trees with an attached chair. Could you show a graph about how the guy would get out of a bucket, so he get, go from the bucket to the tree? But you're not going to charge me for the paper. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but I need to know because I'm giving my job. <laughs> So, I would play picture. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Sounds <laughs> like. Uh, hey, man. So for them to, and this is this this is probably going to happen. I haven't seen it very often. Most of them don't want to get out of the bucket. You know, it's really easy to do work from a bucket. But <clears throat> they'll get into position. They'll have their climbing line will go around the main portion of the tree, tied into their saddle. So not only are they lanyarded into the bucket here with the safety lanyard, but they're also tied in the tree. At this point, they can undo this safety lanyard, step out into the tree, because they've already anchored themselves with a climbing, approved climbing system into the tree. And these systems that we're climbing on are a variation of climbing systems that have been used for over 100 years in North America for climbing trees, so it's not some new fangled. And you'll see out there a combination of typical basic arborist climbing and some high angle rope access equipment and rock climbing. They've kind of, kind of getting this morphing of more efficient, more ergonomic tools, morphed into our climbing systems. Did that help you with that question? Yeah, thank you. So they can get out of the bucket as long as they're tied into the tree before they get out of the bucket or before they release their attachment to the bucket. Uh, buckets, while we're on this page, some buckets have a built-in anchor point or ring. Their engineers have rated it. That's what their engineers said. That's where they want you to anchor to. Uh, another option is there'll be like a body belt that's a boom strap that straps right to the boom. It's got, you know, your standard, you guys have all seen them. You know, it's the standard D-ring and, and they clip into that and that's out on a strap. That's acceptable as well. Um, there's some value to both. Um, some buckets, and this doesn't, this doesn't mean they're climbing illegally, but some buckets, when you attach to the ring that's inside the control box area, if you were to fall out, your lanyard crashes through fiberglass and all kinds of stuff. Um, so it's not a really smart design, obviously. They, I guess they figure no one will ever come out. Um, the, most common, the most common way people get tossed out of the bucket, how do you think that is, anybody? The, the, the vehicle is hit. Gravity. What's that? You said the vehicle moves? Yeah. Nope, but that's a good one. That will happen. What did you say, sir? The boom is out of the of gravity? Nope. Of one of the most common ways these guys get chucked out of this bucket is they cut something and it doesn't go where they wanted it to. It lands on the fiberglass. How many fisher people do we have in the room? I love to fish. Use fiberglass or graphite or bamboo. What happens when the fish gets on the line? Bends it down. What happens when the fish breaks line? They'll drop a... 800 pound top, it was supposed to go that way, they didn't know what they were doing, it fell on the boom, it bends it down, limb falls off, literally catapults. Wow. And there have been a number of deaths because the individual was not wearing any type of fall restraint or fall arrest. Yes, sir. But, but, you know, if that, if that anchorage point is in the, say the floor of the bucket. It's not, it's actually about waist high, right around where the the boom okay, actually attaches. But, but if you were using a true fall restraint, yeah. that would keep you in the bucket. I'm with you. But they don't do that. Most mm -hmm. Everyone's wearing fall arrest that I've seen. <clears throat> and what I really appreciated about your EM385 was you, you allow someone to wear just a body belt, but it has to be a very, very short lanyard. Yeah, yeah. Okay. That would keep me from coming out, wouldn't it? That's right. right. I just want you to know something. Uh, I'm 220 pounds. You're talking a six foot breakaway lanyard. I'm almost six feet tall. How far down will I go? Your feet. Yeah. yeah. I'll probably, yeah, think about it. When we're, I'm in the bucket and I'm lifting the bucket up. 
until I get about 18 feet up. If I fall out, I'm going to break my legs hitting the bucket truck. Yeah, and that's why I asked. That's why I was asking earlier about knowing whether they're climbers or not. Because to me, if they're not a climber, they have no reason to get out. Show me the money. So right. Show yeah. me the card. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, what are you well, doing? I think what it is is if they're not going to climb on the bucket, why would we allow them to wear fall resting gear instead of fall restraint? And that's a great, uh, it's a great question. If they're not, why would they only wear this as opposed to this? Is that what you're saying? Well, well, why have why have a, a lanyard that's so long that they can physically get out of the bucket if they're not going to get out of the bucket? Well, I think, I don't know where the standard came from, but I can tell you the big utility companies that employ tens of thousands of linemen who get out in these buckets every day, they, and prune trees every day, they wear a body belt with short lanyard because they know from their own uh, job site safety analysis and their own accident record recording that they're much better off with a short little lanyard that doesn't allow them out. There you go. Yeah, I mean, to me, I don't... Don't ask me where it came from. I don't know if it's 19. That's the other standard, you guys. You guys familiar with 1910-269? Power distribution. Thank you. And 331, which is all this training and whatnot you're supposed to have in order to comply with 269. Um, you know, there'll be times when they, they're 266, they're EM385, they're 269, 331, ANCZ 133, all on the same job site. Yeah. Well, I think if we started wearing, um, just using a body belt, that wouldn't go over good on the court. They want to see a full body. It's, it's belt. in but, your standard. But theoretically, you can wear a body belt. Well, well here's the thing that's going to happen. We if this guy there. knows that he's going to use the bucket to get into the access the tree with, he's not going to have full. He's yeah, going to be wearing. We have a guy just his, a body his, belt, but we made him do full. Body yeah, this belt. guy who's going to get out is going to be wearing his climbing harness, mm -hmm. work positioning harness, with his little lanyard. He's going to get in the tree, he's going to set his rope, he's going to tie in so he can't fall, he's going to release himself from the bucket, and he's going to climb out. And then the guy on the ground is going to probably climb up and move the bucket out of the way so that he can do the work that he needs to do. Different bird. So yeah, when you, and I'll, I definitely want to show you what the system looks like outside. So, um, Other questions? These are good questions. You sure you don't want me to stay all day? That's fine. <laughs> It's between Gene and Jerry. <laughs> very good information. Yeah. Well, the uh, thing is, is that we, you know, the reason why that little thing's running in the back is because as we approach different missions, I mean, we, we haven't yep. touched hurricane yep. season, so, and we had this issue in Katrina, so yep. as much as we can provide consistency yep. to our, you know, responsibilities out in the field, as much as we can get an idea of why and what and how, then I think we, you know, it's very beneficial, so I sure. appreciate you taking the time to do that. And I'm more than happy, you know, at a later date. If, if, if some, I think we could put together curriculum to help you that would be about an eight-hour course. Um, you know, probably a handful, 15 student at a time, eight hours. We could probably hit 80% of what you need to know before you go into that emergency or that storm situation. So, Other questions? Those, these are good. Poor Norm standing out there wondering what we're doing in here. I should have brought him in. Yeah. Well, we talked about one of the things are when I see these guys as daily reports is they've always, at least on this mission, are always identifying the fact that we see Bill, Bob, Susie, Karen, whatever, just leaning yeah. way out and working on that. Yeah. So work me through the fact that we're not going to get sick watching. As long as they're not falling out, they're in the bucket. They're in the bucket. You know, there's that gray area between my center of mass is now gone <laughs> over the lip and my center of mass is still behind the lip. You know, who are we to make that determination? You know, the bucket's not going to fit everywhere, and you're always, it always seems you're going to be six inches too short. Now, if they're having to climb up to where their feet are not no longer on the bottom of the platform, yes, now we have an issue, okay, because they, they run the risk of, and you'll notice the buckets are fairly high. You know, when you get the 380 pounders that are seven feet tall, their center of mass is typically above the lip of the bucket. Most of us in this room, our center of mass will be below the lip of the bucket. So, but if I'm throwing one leg up to get something, yeah, that's a, we run the risk of falling out. And even though I fall out, I can still be severely injured. We've got issues if the harness is not fitted to me properly, I could, there could be a strangulation hazard. Uh, if it's not fitted to me properly, there could be some injuries to body parts. I'll be <laughs> careful what I say. I have photos if you don't believe me. Um, but the other thing is they're also hanging there. So that's the, the value in having the crew trained is there's a, there's a syndrome known as suspension trauma. Mm -hmm. That's where if they hang there too long and, and, 
and I don't have any clear definitive. I've got medical reports from a French study. I've got some stuff from the U.S. We're talking five to 30 minutes, you know, and if a person's hanging there any length of time, the blood can pull in the extremities. They're not dead. The problem is when you bring them down, you release the pressure, you're letting all this toxic blood back in, and then you send them into a ser series of different shocks, which I, I'm not a doctor, but you need a number of different drugs and special training to deal with. So, you know, there's an argument, do we even want them coming out of the bucket, you know, but for the short lane or long lane? But the buckets are designed to roll. I mean, designed some to are, and some aren't. Like I was out on cruise close to Birmingham, and they've got old style buckets that don't. You're going to have to, if the, if, if the person's injured in the bucket, you bring the bucket down, now you have to climb on top of the bucket and literally pull them out. But some of the newer buckets you even have hydraulics that'll tip them, or you pull pens and they drop forward on a hinge. One of the things you identified <coughs> the other day is the, the proximity, because not that we are likely to see this, but you, know, you have proximity distances yep. with respect to transmission lines that yep. are way encroaching beyond what our normal standard would allow, but because they are made of composites and things like that, there is a standard that allows you to sneak in there. Isn't yep. it? The the, um, proximity in our industry is 10 feet. Like up to, when you start getting into sub-transmission voltages, it may be a little more, and when you get into transmission, like the big high power lines, it gets even further. But for typical primary distribution, that's the power one you see up and down the neighborhoods. Um, in the Z133, there's a chart. If you're a qualified line clearance tree trimmer, and to be that, you have to have first aid CPR. You have to have been through an electrical hazard awareness training program. You also have to have practiced first aid, not first aid, but uh, aerial rescue and emergency response. And you also have to have documented on the job experience doing that type of work. You've got that four things, you're qualified. So once you're qualified and know how to work around energized conductors, that chart, if you know what the voltage is, <laughs> say it's a 7200 line running in a neighborhood, I can read my chart. I know that I can come within up to 2.4 and two feet four inches of that energized conductor. So yeah, we can get way within proximity if we need to. In some cases we will, so. What was the second part to that question? Was it? No, I got it. But yeah, if they're not if they're not a qualified line clearance person QLC, you know, you it's ten feet. No, if any part of the tree comes within ten feet of the wire, the trunk, one tip of the branch, it becomes an electrical hazard, and you have to be a QLC in order to even approach the tree. No part of your body, no part of your truck can come can come closer than ten feet. If you're a QLC, you, re you look, what's my maximum nominal voltage? Okay, it's 14.4, I read my chart, it's still 2 foot 4. I can come within 2 foot 4 of that to do the work, only if I'm qualified. And that goes for any wire, any hardware on the pole. Bone, cable, fiber optic, guy wire, neutral, all of it. Okay, other questions? Other questions? You guys good? Anything on chainsaw? Anything on fall protection? Fall restraint, work positioning, fall rest, bucket trucks? See it. Hmm? The, rest is, the rest is visual. All right. You guys ready to go on a field trip? Yes, sir. All right. <laughs> I don't know. If this is the first floor, what's the floor below us called? <laughs> we're gonna be we're gonna be in the parking lot. To the right of the basement, uh, there'll be a red Toyota next to the handicapped parking, and Norm will be down there. Okay. So we're going to head, if you guys will all Must make your way there in the next five minutes, and then we'll go over some stuff, and then we'll cut you loose as soon as Jerry and I feel like uh, we want to right there. Okay.